At daybreak, the emperor dressed and set off with the guard following. He met the advance party and went on ahead. At a distance away, he had his battalion halt and lined up in columns by platoon. On the left side of the road was a hill that the Corsican battalion was getting ready to occupy. Already a few companies were climbing it. To the right, there was a small plain into which he sent the poles. A few Mamelukes and all his retinue on horseback. The emperor sent his ADC, Colonel Rule, to inform the 5th Line Regiment of his arrival. Its commander told him he was forbidden to communicate with them. His hands were tied. But a faraway cry reached us, that of Viva l'Empereur. Colonel Rule came back, informed his majesty of the general feeling, leaving no doubt. All that was needed to take over the troops and remove their commander was for him to show himself and speak to the soldiers. War Commissioner Vautier was sent to advise the battalion commander that he was holding him responsible toward France and posterity for the orders he gave. Meanwhile, he ordered the guard to place their weapons under their arms. He had the tricolor unfurled and the band marching ahead played Allons, Enfants de la Patrie. All were electrified, both our battalion and the Grenoble troops. The emperor wearing the little gray overcoat that so many times had had a magical effect on soldiers, accompanied by generals Drouot, Cambron, and the Grand Marshal, walked up to the 5th Line Regiment. His Majesty was soon recognized. He said to them, Kill your emperor, you may do so. Viva l'Empereur was the only reply. An old soldier with tears in his eyes walked up to him and clicked the ramrod into his rifle. You can see how much we wanted to kill you. In an instant, the tricolor cockades they had placed in their packs replaced the white cockades, which, after the battalion departed, marked the place where it had stood, and they fraternized with the guard. When the order was restored, the emperor said, I come with a handful of brave men, for I am counting on the people and on you. The Bourbon throne is illegitimate because it was not erected by the nation. It is contrary to the national will because it is contrary to the country's interests and insists only in the interest of a few families. Ask your fathers. Ask all these people coming from nearby. You shall learn from their lips what the Bourbon have in store for France. Then turning to the crowd of people who had come to see him, he said, Is it not true that in your communities you are threatened with the return of the tithe? of privileges, of feudal rights, and of all the abuses from which your successes had delivered you? Yes, sire, we were threatened with these. Our parish priests were already having storage sheds built. An ADC to General Marchand, what was with the troops coming from Grenoble, when he saw the enthusiasm and attachment of the people and troops for the emperor. He left to go and form his general. A few officers took after him to catch him, but he had a better horse and escaped. The 5th Line Regiment and the engineers and sappers asked to make up the advance element. The crowd of residents pressed along the route and provided accompaniment by singing songs honoring the emperor. He had been on horseback all day, and he was very tired and had a cold. But his majesty insisted on taking advantage of the ever-growing enthusiasm to enter Grenoble. When his ADC arrived, General Marchand, commanding the division, ordered the city gates closed. Should he not be afraid of any communication between the king's troops and those of the emperor? What had occurred before Lamur assured him of what would happen as soon as his division recognized the emperor and saw the tricolor. A young officer of the Grenoble National Guard, Monsieur Dumoulin, came forward and offered the emperor his sword and his wealth. He had left Grenoble a few hours previously and informed the emperor that he could count on Colonel Le Bedoyer, the goodwill of the garrison, and that of the population. He provided news of Dr. Emery, who had actively prepared the town patriots. Monsieur de Moulin stayed with the emperor as military aid and received the cross. Between the Zia and Grenoble, the adjutant major of the Seven Line Regiment came to tell the emperor that his colonel, Monsieur de la Bedoyer, was bringing his regiment with him. Half an hour later, he appeared carrying the formal eagle of his regiment stuck on the tip of a tree branch. The emperor took the eagle, kissed it, and after congratulating this young colonel on his patriotic courage, embraced him. The seventh line dumped along the road, and he inspected it and went on his way. The regiment of 1,800 men doubled the emperor's forces. The crowd of people quadrupled them, and cries of Vive l'Empereur, down with the priests, 
down with combined taxes accompany this triumphal march up to Grenoble. Having arrived before Grenoble at 9.30 p.m., the emperor found the city doors locked and the troops restricted to the barracks. The cries of evil emperor shouted on the ramparts by the soldiers and inhabitants left no doubt regarding their sentiments. The ramparts were crowded with soldiers from the 3rd Engineering Regiment of 2,000 men, the 4th Artillery Regiment, where Napoleon had become a captain 20 years earlier. The two other battalions of the 5th, the 11th Line Regiment, and the 4th Hussars. The soldiers yelled from the top of the ramparts that the powder was wet. Torches were lit everywhere, but they were ordered put out. The emperor summoned General Marchand to open the city doors. Half an hour later, the general asked that he be given until the next day. The sappers then undertook to break down the door with their axes. The first blows had barely landed when the door was open. His majesty made his entrance amid an army and population full of enthusiasm. In Grenoble, the emperor became a power to contend with. He could sustain a war if necessary. He could count on the troops and population who were greeting him with such a show of happiness. The emperor lodged at an inn after his supper. The citizens of Grenoble brought him the doors to the city as they couldn't offer him the keys. The next day, his majesty received the town officials and the corps heads. All the speeches were unanimous. All stated that they had no obligation towards princes imposed by foreigners. The emperor's former mathematics teacher arrived and asked if he could see his former pupil. The emperor, who was in his room, came to the door to greet him, embraced him, and remained a few moments chatting with him. This kind old man was enchanted with the flattering reception he had just received. Colonel Rune, born in the vicinity of Grenoble, came to present his father, whom the emperor took great pleasure in meeting, saying that he would see to the future fortune of his son who had been one of his guides in Egypt. During his stay in Elba, this officer, along with Dr. Emery, the battalion surgeon major, maintained a very active correspondence with the city's patriots. Countess Marchand, wife of the general, had not left with him. She came to see the emperor and told him that her husband would not join his cause without being a traitor to his oaths, but would do so as soon as the king had left the kingdom. The emperor showed this lady all the graciousness he was capable of when he wished to please, assuring her that he would have taken great pleasure in seeing her husband. The general did not see fit to present himself. As the prefect, Monsieur Fourier, a member of the Egyptian commission, had left town, the emperor found a replacement in the person of prefecture counselor, and he named as commander of the National Guard a former major in the Imperial Guard. At two... The emperor passed the troops in review. Two cries of vive l'empereur down at the Provence. The 6,000 soldiers had the previous day done the old tricolor cockades, which they had kept in their packs as mementos of their past glory. The emperor said to the officers who reported this, and it proved the troops' opinion in a striking manner, that they had held on to them as a treasure when they were forced to accept the anti-national flag of the Bourbon and that the latter had committed a grave mistake when they prescribed these colors that had been forever French. Immediately after the parade, these troops set out for Lyon, preceded by a population singing patriotic tunes. The first point of the venture had been scored. The emperor was master of Grenoble, where he had arrived with lightning speed and which was the center of an important province with all kinds of resources gathered in the arsenal. He was leaving behind him a patriotic and devoted population, and he could proceed to Lyon without fear. What had just occurred in the Grenoble division, he could expect from that of Lyon, and he was not mistaken. Chapter 8. On March 9th, the emperor went on to sleep in Bourguin, preceded by the 4th Hussars and followed by the entire garrison. The crowd and the enthusiasm were ever-growing in spite of the rain and the bad weather that day. Ever since the landing, cries of down with the priests, down with combined taxes, had accompanied the emperor, who never answered anything to such calls. The emperor was in his coach, tired and with a cold, and went to bed as soon as he arrived. That night, he received news of Lyon through a staff officer, Monsieur Moline de Saint-Yon, sent by General Breillet. The sentiment in this great city was not at all uncertain, but the presence of Monsieur the Count of Artois, who had just arrived there, restrained its outburst. 
and prevented the citizenry from going out to meet Napoleon. He learned from the same person that the population had objected to the bridges of La Guillotière and Morand being blocked, and that Monsieur and Marshal MacDonald wanted to defend Lyon against the advice of the War Council. They had no artillery. He said to the young officer, go back and assure Briey of my friendship. The emperor immediately gave orders to Count Bertrand to gather some boats at Mirabel and close the Paris road to the prince and the marshal who wanted to prevent him from entering Lyon. On the 10th, the emperor set off for Lyon, the army ahead of him, and it was not long before he was in the midst of the column, his saddle horses following his coach. He climbed on horseback and appeared at the head of his troops. Residents of Lyon were continuously arriving to join his majesty, describing the agitation in town. The people were waiting for but one word, to demolish the bridge barricades that even the troops did not wish to defend. The emperor was informed that Monsieur, while inspecting the cavalry, had stopped in front of an old soldier from the 13th Dragoons, wearing several chevrons, and said to him, Come, my good man, cry out, long live the king. No, my lord, I cannot do it. We shall not fight against our father. That response said everything, turning towards General Breyer, who was near him, and he said, there is nothing more to hope for. And he departed with some of his courtiers and a single National Guardsman who accompanied him on horseback. General Breyer, informed of his departure, sent a detachment of the 13th Dragoons to serve as escort. The Duke of Orléans, which had come with him, had already left Lyon. Marshal MacDonald insisted on defending the city. Two battalions posted at the Guillotier Bridge were to prevent its being crossed. A reconnaissance party from the 4th Hussars and a few Poles, led by Colonel Yermanovsky, showed up, crying, Viva l'Empereur! The two battalions were ordered to open fire, but they put down their weapons and also cried, Viva l'Empereur! The marshal, who was present at this defection, headed for Paris, riding a horse lent by General Breyer at the outskirts of Vez. He was stopped by two hussars from the fourth, the marshal being alone, wearing a blue coat and only a colonel's epaulettes. General Baron de Jean arrived, identifying him and had him released. As early as March 6th, Napoleon and those following him were outlawed by the following proclamation, which Chancellor Dombray had borrowed from ancient legislation. Perhaps it was used against Mandran. King's Ordinances Relating to General Security Measures. Moniteur, March 7th, 1815. Louis, by the grace of God, King of France and Navarre, salutations to all who read this. Article 12 of the Constitutional Charter has charged us with making rules and ordinances regarding the security of the state. It would be severely compromised should we not take prompt measures to repress the venture just undertaken against our kingdom and put an end to the plots and attempt at inciting civil war and destroying the government. Because of this, and on the report made to us by our beloved and faithful Knight Chancellor of France, Sir Dombray, commander of our orders, and on the advice of our council, we have ordered, and it is as follows. Article 1. Napoleon Bonaparte is declared a traitor and rebel for having entered the department of the VAR under arms. All governors, military commanders, national guards, civilian authorities, and even civil citizens are enjoined to seek him out, arrest him and promptly bring him before a court martial, which after identifying him shall pronounce him the penalties provided under law. Articles two shall be likewise punished as guilty of the same crimes. All military and employees of all ranks who have accompanied or followed Bonaparte in his invasion of French territory, unless within eight days following the publication of this ordinance, they surrender to our governors commanders of military divisions, generals, at, or civil administrators. Article 3 shall also be sought out and punished as agitators and accomplices of rebellion and attempts to change the form of government and provoke a civil war. All civil and military administrators, heads and employees in said administrations, payers and collectors of public funds, and even ordinary citizens who would either directly or indirectly provide aid and assistance to Bonaparte. Article 4 shall be likewise punished in accordance with Article 102 of the Penal Code. Those who, through speeches given in public places or meetings, posters, or printed writings, have taken part or encouraged citizens to take part in the revolt or abstained from stopping it. Our Chancellor, our Ministers, Secretaries of State, and our Director of the Police 
each, as far as he's concerned, are charged with the execution of this ordinance that shall be inserted in the evening bulletin and sent to all governors of military divisions, generals, commanders, prefects, subprefects, and mayors of our kingdom with orders to have it printed and posted in Paris, as well as elsewhere and wherever needed. Given in the Tuileries Chateau on March 6, 1815, the 20th year of our reign. Signed, Louis, for the king, the Chancellor of France, signed, Dembray. In the eyes of those who had published such a proclamation, the emperor's landing and his march on Lyon and Paris were to be considered hostile acts by the people's rights. Troops joining him were in a state of rebellion. In the face of this same rebellion and Napoleon's immense influence, they were forced to commit the heir apparent to the throne as the king could not come himself. As the emperor said in St. Helena, nothing was wire, wiser and better conceived than sending out the princes to meet Napoleon. As the king could not come himself, it was a way for a city of 100,000 not to fall to 800 men as Paris remained in the hands of the king. But the fall of the second city in the kingdom must have foretold that of the capital. Around 7 p.m., the emperor entered Lyon, surrounded by officers and generals of all ranks, who had come out to meet him. At his side could be seen Lieutenant General Breyer, commanding the Lyon division, who had come to meet him with a large staff. The enthusiasm of this great city was at its highest, and happiness and its exhilaration were painted on all faces. It is impossible to imagine the crowd of men, children, and old people who ran out into the bridges and embankments at the risk of being crushed. Everyone wanted to see him, hear him, be certain that it was indeed him and not some imaginary person, the objects of their hopes and not one of disastrous illusions. Cries of evil l'Empereur down at the priests, down at the exiles, down at feudalism, rang through the air like a drum roll. The emperor was touched and shared in this public elation, but did not fail to note these accusations against the royal government, which offered him a sure guarantee of the success of his plans, as well as proof of the call sent out to him by the French people. Humiliated by foreigners, belittled by their government, and concerned about their future, his majesty stayed at the archbishop's residence, where all had been prepared to receive him, to put his own safety into the hands of the dismounted National Guard. No doubt, he privately approved of the mounted National Guardsmen who had accompanied the prince, but in St. Helena, he declared it untrue, that he asked to see the man and gave him the cross, as had been claimed. It is also false that he refused to help of the mounted National Guard because it had failed to do its duty and accomplish Monsieur as it should have done. It was rather because the institution did not recognize a mounted National Guard. On March 11th, the emperor, accompanied by a few generals and a picket of hussars, went to Place Belcourt and reviewed General Briey's division. His majesty saw with pleasure this square that had 15 years before he had restored it from its ruins and whose first stone he had laid. The crowd was augmented by the surrounding population who had come to see him. The cries of Viva l'Empereur and the enthusiasm were the same as the day before. When the emperor returned to the archbishop's residence, he found the gallery full of generals, colonels, and magistrates. He spoke to each in his own language and went into the drawing room where he received the imperial court, the municipal authorities, the corps leaders, and the heads of the National Guard. His majesty ordered all the commanders of corps stationed in the surrounding countryside to proceed to this or that point along his route or the adjoining departments. He wrote to Marshal Ney, who was at Long le Saulnier with his army to get underway and come join him. From Lyon, the emperor was already issuing de decrees and administering the country. That day, General Briey's division formed the advanced party leading the way to Paris. After issuing a proclamation to the people of Lyon, the emperor departed on the 13th, deeply moved by the sentiments shown him. The simple words, people of Lyon, I love you perfectly expressed the emotion he felt. The emperor had a carriage purchased to continue his journey and gave me the coach. Monsieur Fleury de Chambouillon joined the emperor in Lyon. He was employed in the cabinet to work in Paris under Baron Fain. In his majesty named him senior counsel and thus rewarded through his first favor a staunch devotion during his missions in Elba and Basel. His Majesty stopped in the afternoon in Villefranche 
and went to the city wall where a large number of wounded soldiers was presented to him. During the night, the emperor arrived in Macon and was lodged at the Hotel du Sauvage. He complained about not having been put up at the prefecture. The next day, he received the congratulations of the municipal authorities and the National Guard. He spoke often to one of the aides, whose candor amused him. This aide had just told him. From the moment he learned of his landing, he had considered him mad. He was not the only one. The emperor's alleged madness was one of the reasons for the success of his venture. The emperor said to them, During the last war, you did not uphold the honor of Burgundy. Sire, it was not our fault. You had given us a poor mayor. The prefect, Monsieur Germain, one of the chamberlains presented to him by Paris in 1804, whom he had made a count, had left. The emperor said, Germain thought he had to run away from me. His person is not so important that we can't do without him. From one town to the next, the population lined the road. The emperor learned in Macon that the Parisian National Guard wanted to defend the king and that this prince refused to leave the Tuileries. He replied to the man bringing the news, the National Guard will maintain order in Paris and the king will not be there waiting for me. What do you think, Breillet? He asked the general who was present and who replied, Sire, let them talk. They won't find a single soldier who will fight against you. And the enthusiasm of the population is such that you will arrive with 500,000 men if you wish. The emperor did not know General Breillet very well and the mission of one of his staff officers, Monsieur Saint-Yon, to Bergouin, had surprised him. He said in St. Helena, his career had been spent far from me. I was hesitant, but the openness with which he greeted me when he came to join me at the head of a large staff of officers dispelled all my doubts. It was especially during our trip from Lyon to Paris that I was able to appreciate all the force of his character. The emperor arrived in Chalon on the 14th. Rain was pouring down, but the population still came out all along the way. He was about to enter the city. He was shown some artillery intended for use against him that had been captured by the people. He congratulated them and seized this occasion to tell them he would always remember their fine conduct in 1814. He sent the Legion of Honor to the mayor of Saint-Jean-de-Lozna, saying, it was for good people like him that I created the Legion of Honor and not for exiles pensioned by our enemies. In Chalon, His Majesty received a deputation from the city of Dijon. The inhabitants had driven at the prefect and the emperor removed the mayor and named another one. On the 15th, the emperor slept in Autun. He received the municipal authorities and severely chided the mayor, who was being dominated by a handful of nobles. Who are you, sir, to let yourself thus be governed by a privileged few? Aren't you yourself a plebeian? Must you abandon the care of the people you administer to? The hatred of the nobility? The emperor removed him from office. On the 16th, we slept in Avalon. And the emperor was welcomed there like everywhere else. And the National Guard officers provided his personal service. He reinstated several civil servants who had been removed for having participated in the defense of the country against foreigners. He issued orders to have the sub-prefect of Semir arrested and sent to jail in Avalon for persecuting the patriots. The emperor arrived the next day, the 17th, in Auxerre, having lunched in Vermonton. The prefect, Monsieur Gamon, Marshal Ney's brother-in-law, had remained at his post. His majesty stayed at the prefecture and found in the drawing room a life-size portrait of himself wearing the imperial garb, as well as busts of the empress and his son. The emperor received congratulations from the authorities and talked about the nation's interests. A few retired officers came to offer their services. During the day, he received an officer from Marshal Ney announcing his imminent arrival. His Majesty summoned Monsieur Viard, vicar of the cathedral, who from his pulpit was preaching fidelity to the established government and organizing the resistance against the emperor's army. It was indeed late, dangerous, and atypical of the character and prudence of a priest. The emperor chided him for incited civil war in the name of a God of peace and mercy, told him he should only concern himself with spiritual matters, and quoted several passages of the Holy Scriptures, to which the vicar did not and could not respond. It was again confirmed 
to the emperor that the king wanted to defend Paris. The only army on which he could depend is now mine. Ney is coming. I cross Provence and the upper Dauphiné with 900 men. Now I have 30,000. Three million peasants ran out along the way and showered me with blessings. Why? Because I have honored France and governed in the spirit of the nation. The Bourbons have brought the foreign yoke and the spirit of exile. France is rejecting these. I am confident about Paris. Louis XVIII is too astute to wait for me at the Tuileries. During the night, the Grand Marshal came to knock at the Emperor's bedroom door, and I opened. He had come to tell the Emperor of the Marshal's arrival in town. The Emperor put off receiving him until the next day, the 18th. The Marshal's first moment was uncomfortable. Was he remembering his promise to the King? It didn't last long. The Grand Marshal had written him that he would be greeted as on the day after Moscow. The Emperor's arms opened. He threw himself into them, and they embraced. Left alone, they talked at length, and Marshal, admitting that he had been carried along by his army, he could not have kept it in the service of the king, and he had left Paris with the full intent of fighting against the emperor. His majesty ordered that boats be gathered to transport a part of the army that was exhausted as far as Fossar. The Yon was swollen, one of the boats sank, and a few of those in it were drowned. This loss of that greatly affected General Breillet, who commanded them, and deeply felt by the emperor, who prided himself on his return, not costing a single human life. That morning, the emperor had reviewed the 14th line regiment, and he then mingled with the crowd, anxious to see him, and returned to the prefecture, accompanied by the same cries of Viva Lumper, down with the priests, down with combined taxes, he had heard since his landing. A few royal emissaries sought and even gained entrance to the prefecture building. They were reorganized, and one of them would have been thrown out the window had not Count Bertrand intervened. The emperor, informed of a few uprisings in the south and of the first movements of the Duke of Angoulême before leaving, took measures to suppress these. Generals Suchet, Girard, and others sent emissaries to inform the emperor of their devotion. The emperor sent a letter to Le Courbe, who was eager to place his patriotism at the emperor's service. The emperor left Auxerre, and the people accompanied him far beyond the city. The emperor was anxious to arrive in Fontainebleau and enter Paris on March 20th. Everywhere, the greatest happiness prevailed along the way. In Fossard, he found a regiment of dragoons who, without officers, were coming to join him. He inspected them and gave out compliments and promotions. He was astonished that young Monsey, who commanded the 3rd Hussars, had felt obliged to run away from him while sending a message that he would never fight against him, but that he had taken an oath from which he had not been released. Several officers and Hussars from the regiment followed the general trend and came to join the emperor. His majesty had me go ahead of him and ordered me to wait for him at Fontainebleau. A palace quartermaster, Monsieur Deschamps, waited for him in Fontainebleau. A palace quartermaster, Monsieur Deschamps, had arrived there and was prepared to receive the emperor. The former concierge was still there, but was on the verge of being dismissed. I arrived at 11 p.m. The rumor had been circulated that in the forest there were 1,100 or 1,200 men ready to abduct the emperor. His majesty stopped four hours in Moray and left only when he received a report that the forest had been searched or that guards were at every outlet in the direction of Paris, Orléans, and Milan. We were then close to the king's army, and I had seen nothing along my way. His majesty arrived at 4 a.m., escorted by a few hundred cavalrymen, Colonels Yermanovsky and Rule, and the palace quartermaster, Monsieur Buisson, galloped by his carriage door. The emperor appeared pleased to find himself again in this palace, which treason had forced him to leave 11 months before. A good fire was lit in his bedroom. He summoned the concierge, one of his former servants, who told him that as soon as the Bourbons came back, they busied themselves removing all the symbols reminiscent of the imperial regime, but the crowned ends sculpted on the bed had escaped their attention and were still there. Having assured him of his continued benevolence towards him and his family and dismissed him, his majesty went to bed. At 7 a.m. he dressed and soon learned of the king's departure. 
which the Grand Marshal, who had just heard the news, came to tell him. Before leaving for Paris, the Emperor ordered that the Elban Battalion be given a day's rest and told me to go straight to Paris between Fontainebleau and Esson. His Majesty was inspecting a regiment. The coachman who was taking me stopped. The Emperor asked what that coach was and on learning it was mine, ordered me to proceed. At the Cour de France, I found the Emperor's carriages, equerries, and household staff. I arrived at the Tuileries at 6 p.m. There was no sign that another sovereign had inhabited this palace. The reception and household staff were at their posts. It merely looked as if His Majesty were returning from a trip. The Emperor arrived only at 8 p.m. on March 20th, having been detained by the crowd gathered along his way and by the congratulations of the generals who came out to greet him. The army that had been assembled, assembled in Ville Juif to fight him served as his escort. When the emperor got out of his carriage, a thousand arms carried him up to his apartments. The giddiness of joy was everywhere. Queen Hortense, dressed in black, was waiting for him in her drawing room. The emperor embraced her affectionately, providing the consolation she was entitled to expect from the friendship of his majesty towards her and Empress Josephine. After these first moments of most legitimate sorrow and regrets, he proceeded into his own drawing room and talked with dignitaries of the empire. All were delighted, even elated, and he shared these sentiments without restraint. His majesty retired to his own quarters only at midnight, exhausted. Many people have claimed that the emperor's return was blemished, that he should have been surrounded by the brave Elbin battalion, that had forced its march to arrive with them. This is what I heard His Majesty stay in St. Helena. I entered Paris, as I did at Grenoble and Lyon at the end of a day's march and at the head of the armies sent to oppose me. I arrived in Paris just as when I returned from Marengo, Austerlitz, Tilsit. I had too many other things to do to waste two days preparing a ceremonial entrance. I would not have sacrificed 15 minutes for that. The emperor's return to the Tuileries, the retaking of power with 900 men without firing a shot or spilling a drop of blood and without any internal conspiracy by the country's inhabitants shall always remain among the marvelous events of which the history of nations offers no or very few examples. Be it audacity or the result of genius, it matters little. We saw it with our own eyes, and it remains unbelievable nevertheless. The emperor had just covered in 20 days a route requiring 40 days march. The emperor had been quietly settling down in Elba in his new situation, but the conditions stipulated by the Fontainebleau Treaty were not fulfilled. They were even violated. An attempt was made on his life, the plan originating in Corsica. An attempt was to be made on his life. The plan, the emperor was informed of this by his friends. There was a plan to restrict his freedom and to confine him on St. Helena. There was no longer obligated to abide by stipulations he alone honored. Force was all that mattered to his enemies while justice, respective treaties, blood relations, and the memory of honorable friendships meant nothing anymore. The goal he had set, the welfare of France, the motives which had led him to abdicate had become meaningless. He recognized that the government succeeding his own was ruling opposite to the nation's interests, that the exile spirit dominated it and was leading it each day from serious errors to even more serious errors, ruining France. He recognized that if he had committed mistakes, he owed his fall less to these than to intrigue treason offered or solicited, but always backed by foreigners and the misfortunes of the 1814 invasions. France missed him and would welcome him with open arms. As long as only his personal interest was compromised, he hesitated. But when, as only the salvation, honor, and glory of the motherland, there was no hesitation. Belonging entirely to France, he would do everything for her. The emperor landed at Gulf Juan on March 1st and marched on Paris every three days. His military forces doubled at every point along his path. The people showered him with their blessings and hopes and showed their willingness to defend him if he were attacked. Peasants and soldiers 
civil servants and magistrates all told him that they were finished had he not come. In 20 days, he was before the walls of Paris at the head of 60,000 men and the king who could not prevent the evil that his courtiers, his ministers, and the privileged classes had brought to France had the painful wisdom to leave his palace in the middle of the night. Thus were the verified the emperor's words to Monsieur Poggi when speaking of the Bourbons. Their government of 19 years was so weak that even with miracle on top of miracle, it could not stand.